Chapter 3 is all about polynomial functions. In this chapter, we'll review what we know about linear and quadratic functions and apply them to polynomials with higher degrees. Let's first start with a little review of quadratics. Lesson 3.1, quadratic functions and zeros. A zero of a quadratic function is defined where the function crosses the x-axis. We also call them just x-intercepts or a solution what we get when we solve a function. There are three different types of answers we'll get when we solve quadratic functions. It's possible that the quadratic function can cross the x-axis at two locations. We would define that as two real solutions. Sometimes the vertex of the quadratic function is right on the x-axis, which means there's only one point that touches the x-axis and it has one real solution. And then the other choice is when the quadratic function, oops, that's an n, doesn't cross the x-axis at all. This means we would have zero real solutions. We've had this come up when we've graphed before, but we were in a different form where we didn't use our x-intercepts as a guide for sketching the quadratic function. If you have zero real solutions, that means technically that there are two imaginary solutions. And we've worked with imaginary answers when we used quadratic formula to solve, and we had a square root of a negative number. When you're asked to solve or find zeros algebraically, our choices are factoring or the quadratic formula. So I wrote the quadratic formula over at the right. You might want to jot that down as a resource if you don't have it memorized. x equals negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac, all of the fraction in the top, divided by 2a on the bottom. And if you recall, a, b, and c are the coefficients in the quadratic function. So let's take a look at some examples down below. The ability to factor and solve quadratics will be useful when we work with higher ordered polynomials. When you're asked to determine the zeros of a function, the first thing we do is set the equation equal to zero. We're trying to work backwards and solve for x. Factoring is the most efficient method, but remember, not everything factors. That's why quadratic formula has to be another option for us. In this case, if we look at numbers that multiply to get 8, but add to get negative 6, this factors pretty quickly into x minus 4 and x minus 2. And you can write them in either order. If you set that equal to 0, we apply what's called the zero product property. Literally set each parenthesis equal to 0, and then solve for x on its own. We get one of our answers to be x equals 4, and the other answer would be 2. That means this quadratic function crosses the x-axis at two locations. In our next example, this makes factoring a little bit more challenging. Remember, we have a number out in front. So when we do that, we have to take a times c and multiply. We have to take that product. 3 times negative 12 is negative 36. Trying to come up with numbers that multiply to equal negative 36 while adding to get 16 at the same time. I know 1 times 36 would give us 36, 2 and 18, and I think we can work with 2 and 18 to get 16 as well. We want to multiply to get negative 36, therefore if I make 2 negative and keep 18 positive, they'd multiply to be negative 36 and add to be 16 at the same time. So then what we need to do, everybody, is split that bx term. Do you remember doing that before? If we have 16x, that's the same as negative 2x plus 18x. We're just splitting up that middle term. The first term and the last term just go first and last. They don't change at all. From here, we group the first two and group the second two terms. If we take a look at 3x squared minus 2x, Notice we could take out an x from each of those parts, and we would have 3x minus 2. Now in that second parenthesis, 18x minus 12, 
We could take the biggest number, which would be 6 out of both of them, and we would get 3x minus 2 again. That means we have 3 or 3x minus 2 as one factor. And then the outside numbers, if we add them together, x plus 6 as my other factor. One thing I didn't do at the very beginning was set the equation equal to 0. So guess what? I'm going to do that now. If we're trying to solve for our x-intercepts or the zeros of our function, we have to set it equal to 0. Applying the zero product property, we need to be careful about solving that first answer. To get x by itself, we have to add 2, but then we also have to divide by 3. So this indicates we're going to have one of our x-intercepts as a fraction. For the other one, it's not quite as difficult. To get x by itself, I'm just going to move 6 over, and x equals negative 6 is our other answer. We've had two factor questions. Let's see what happens in our last example. y equals 2x squared plus 8x minus 7. If we try to do a times c, 2 times 7 is 14. Now numbers that go into 14 are 1 times 14 and 2 times 7. Unfortunately, neither of those factor sets would give us 8 in the middle. That means this is not factorable. So if it's not factorable, we have to do quadratic formula to solve. And that can indicate that maybe we'll have a square root in our answer, or we may have no solution at all, which would be an imaginary solution. Now a equals 2, b equals 8, and c equals positive 7. Let's see what happens when we plug it into quadratic formula. x equals negative b, which would be negative 8, plus or minus, big square root here, b squared, which is 8 squared, minus 4ac, so 4 times 2 times 7. All over, make sure you put it all over 2 times a, which will be 2 times 2. All right, let's simplify. Negative 8 plus or minus, 8 squared is 64, 4 times 2 times 7 is 56. All over 2 times 2, which is 4. Now 64 minus 56 would be 8. Sorry, I'm running out of room here. I hope you guys can get this to fit. I'm running out of space. So 64 or minus 56 is 8, and then all over 4. Now we have to be careful here. We have to simplify the square root first before we reduce the fraction. The number on the inside of the square root doesn't cross out with the 4 on the bottom because it's a different value. It technically isn't 8. It's the square root of 8, which would be a smaller answer. But 8 breaks down into 4 times 2. And if we take the square root of each of those, we would get negative 8 plus or minus. The square root of 4 comes out as a 2, and then that square root 2 stays on the inside. That's the simplified version of the square root of 8, 2 square root 2, all over 4. To reduce this fraction, oops, I don't know why I just drew that line there. Sorry, I was trying to slide the screen over, but I didn't have the right prompt ready. All right, there we go. To reduce this fraction, the numbers on the outside of the square root all need a common factor. 2 goes into all of them. What that means is if we divide by 2, just for the parts on the outside, we would get negative 4 plus or minus square root of 2 all over 2. That would be the exact answer for our x-intercepts. If we were sketching the graph, we would need to find the decimal approximations, or if we were solving an application problem. So this is lesson 3.1, a recap of solving when we have a quadratic function.